Hey friends, welcome to Unpacking the Mass. This week we step into Palm Sunday, and of course this is a huge moment in the life of our faith because we're stepping into Holy Week. In many ways, everything about Lent that we've been walking through is about to really just slide down right into Good Friday and the events of Holy Week, and then of course Easter. And the readings for Palm Sunday are pretty amazing. You know, it seems like all across the world of Christianity, when you get to Palm Sunday, typically, you know, even the churches that don't follow the lectionary or not really using the liturgy will want to start talking about these events because they're so monumental to our faith. And of course, today, as we look into this stuff, there are so many things to think about. But what I really want to do is focus my remarks today on one particular aspect of Palm Sunday. So I'm going to read through these readings and just make a few brief comments about about them. But really, I want to key in on one particular area of what we see in the gospel reading this morning, because it's always meant a ton to me. So uh, let's begin. And of course, when you come to church, the beginning with the processional, of course, we have the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 11 about the events of Palm Sunday. Now, when you were maybe, or when I was a kid anyway, we used to do this thing at my church where we'd get the palm branches and we'd, you know, everybody would have a palm branch and we'd wave them around and it was just kind of a fun thing to do. And, you know, this of course is where this comes from. And it begins in in Mark's gospel. Sorry, I said Matthew. I mean, Mark's gospel, chapter 11, like this. When Jesus and his disciples drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples And said to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately on entering it, you will find a colt tethered on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone should say to you, why are you doing this? Reply, the master has need of it and will send it back here at once. So they went off and found a colt tethered at the gate outside on the street and they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered him, just as Jesus had told them to, and they permitted them to do it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and they put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. There's where the palms come. Proceeding as well as those following, kept crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is to come, Hosanna, in the highest. So of course you see this scene, you know, it's a famous scene where Jesus walks in on this 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 donkey which of course is an illusion, it's it's a fulfillment of prophecy and everyone is like super excited to see Jesus, which you know, they're in Jerusalem, they're getting ready and here he comes, his tri- they call it his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But you have to know that in the back of Jesus' mind while everybody is like, "Oh yeah, he's our guy." He knows deep in his heart that this is all not going to end well from a worldly perspective anyway. Like this cry of adulation that he's receiving from these people was not something that was rooted in who he truly was. It was rooted in, could be a number of different things. It could have just been they heard this guy does miracles and they want a piece of him. It could be that some of them thought maybe he is the king, you know, he's coming in the name of the Lord and maybe he's coming to, you know, basically overthrow the Romans. And they're basically like putting their expectations on Jesus. So as he's coming, they're saying, okay, this is great. Now, does Jesus live up to these expectations? Nope. And as, of course, as we know the story, you know, very, a very short time later, this same crowd is going to be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus knows that. I mean, have you ever encountered someone in your life who has given you praise But you know, deep in your heart, it's just a matter of time before they're going to be hating me. It's just a matter of time before I'm going to disappoint them and let them down according to their own expectations. You know, it can happen to us, can it? And I wonder if, you know, Jesus in his heart was able to receive some of that that adulation without thinking that way. I, I don't know, but I know that he had to be in the back of his mind wondering, okay, you know, what about that guy over there? That guy there, is he going to cry out, crucify him? What about those little kids over there that are that are waving their palm branches? Are they going to be the ones making fun of me when I'm on the cross? 
What about that lady over there? Is she going to be scoffing at me very soon? And friends, we have to recall that Jesus knows everything. Even when we come before him with our praise, he knows the sins that we have yet to commit. Now, here's what I ultimately think about this. I think that Jesus receives praise from people who genuinely mean it, even at that moment, even though he knows that they're going to sin. Because guess what? He still died for these people. He still went to the cross for them. He didn't walk into Jerusalem and or on the back of this. He didn't ride into Jerusalem. And then when he saw this, went, you know what? You guys are liars. You're fakes. So forget this. The whole thing is off. No, friends. He still does what he comes to do, which is to forgive people from their sins, even the sin of fake worship. And today, as we look at these readings and unpacking the mass, we're going to see two instances of worship. We're going to see fake worship and we're going to see extravagant worship. And what we see here in the beginning in Palm Sunday, you know, ultimately is going to go down in history as sort of fake worship because real worship would have never cried out for Jesus to be crucified later. But remember, Jesus still, still came. He still received this praise. And according to John's gospel, you know, this was, this was to fulfill what is written. Fear no more, O daughter of Zion. See your king comes seated upon an ass's colt. Okay, John's reading, and maybe some of you will get John's reading in your in your mass readings. Says his disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus had been glorified, they remembered all these things that were written about him and that they had done this for him. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind, this idea of, of getting all fired up about Jesus when you think he's come to do what you want him to do, which the world's all about that, okay? We see people, oh, you know, they all, I, love, I love Jesus, I love God, until God doesn't agree with them, then they hate him. I mean, a lot of people can relate to that, right? Look around this world, you see that in the culture. People are like, oh yeah, I love God, this and that, but you know, when they're face to face with what the scripture teaches and what the church teaches about God. And it's not what they think, man, they can turn just like that. Okay. So our first reading in mass is going to come from Isaiah 50 verses four through seven. This is a pretty interesting prophecy. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning, he opens my ear that I may hear. And I have not rebelled have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have my face, I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. Now, clearly this is about Jesus. This is about what Jesus knows that he's come to do in the midst of this. And he has, of course, a well-trained tongue. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, Jesus never just flies off the handle and then says stuff and, co- and goes, oh man, I better go back and apologize for that. I really shouldn't have done that. I mean, we do that, don't we? I mean, how many times have you done that? I have to do that every once in a while where you react to things, usually when you're being attacked or criticized and you lash out at people. And then later you go, man, I'm sorry, I overreacted. Jesus doesn't have that problem, right? He, he's, when, when he's being attacked and beaten, he says nothing. He doesn't respond. He he gives himself to these beatings. Now you think, you know, you hear this, I gave my back to those who beat me. Of course, you know, I think about the, you know, the second sorrowful mystery, the scourging at the pillar where Jesus is beaten. And it says, you know, he gave his back. He didn't have to do that. Those chains around that, that pillar that held him there, Jesus could have it, it caused those things to vaporize with just a thought in his mind. He could have got up, turned around and just, you know, boom, those guys were done. But it wasn't those bindings that were around him that held him there, friends. It was his love for you and for me. And ultimately, his love for his father who had had put this before him. And remember Jesus in in the garden in agony saying, not my will, but your will be done. And he set his face like flint. He was like, I am. Nothing's going to stop me. It doesn't matter how much they hurt me. It doesn't matter how much they beat me. I will fulfill my mission to save souls and redeem the world. The Lord God is my help. Therefore, I am not disgraced. You know, Jesus, man, many people looked at him and they said, he saved others. Can't he save himself? Come down off the cross. What a disgrace. Oh, King of the Jews. They mocked him. They tormented him. They humiliated him. They looked at him and they were like, oh, wow. What a fake. What a phony. Why? Because they couldn't imagine a scenario where 
the king of kings, the king of the Jews would be crucified by the Romans. That So that just must have in their minds proved to them that he was a fake. Now, of course, if they would have really understood the scriptures, they would have understand. And he tried to tell them over and over again, didn't he, friends? He said, the son of man must, must, he must be put in the ground, but he will be raised up. And, and over and over again, you know, they didn't get it. Think about what he said, unless a kernel of wheat dies. We read that before. And, and it, uh, it, won't, it won't sprout up, right? Destroy this temple. And again, I will rebuild it in three days. Over and over again, Jesus gives all sorts of illusions to his death, but they, they can't get it because the plans of God are not our plans. And we don't often understand, my friends, what he has planned for us. And if, and if we did understand, that's no guarantee that we'd feel any better. <laughs> Is You know, so, sometimes we think, oh, if I could just know what God wants from me, if I could just know the plan, then I could be okay with that. Well, maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. You know, there's a reason why God doesn't lay out everything before us perfectly clearly, because let's face it, if we knew everything, man, we'd probably be freaked out. I remember when I was a kid, one of one of the one of the pastors in my life that was really really influential in my in my journey as a Christian. He was preaching at this at this retreat, and I was a young man. I was probably like I don't know, maybe like in sixth or seventh grade. And he called me out of the the crowd of people, and he pulls me up in front of this group of people, and he's got tears in his eyes, and he looks at me and he says, "Keith, I wish I was you," and he's bawling. I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean you wish you was you wish you were me? And, and this was a man who's a god, he was a godly man. And, and he had a lot of supernatural experiences, you know. And you you can you can think what you want to think about that. But I believe that that he was closer to the Lord than than a lot of us even were able to realize. And afterwards I met with him and I talked, I said, What do you what do you what happened? And he told me that he had a vision for basically you know, some, if not all of God's plan for my life. And he just, he just said, boy, I wish I was you. I wish I was you. And I said to him, well, tell me what it was. What is it? What is it? You know? And he says, that's the last thing I'd ever do. I said, why not? Why wouldn't you tell me what it is? If, If you know something about my life, about what God has for me that I don't know, tell me what it is so I can do it. And he said, that's exactly why I'm not going to tell you, Keith. Because if, if I if I lay it out before you, then then you will be freaked out and you will try to make it happen, which will mean you will completely mess. You know, sometimes the things that God has for us, if we if we think we know too much, then we get too involved, and then we become more like leading the the you know leading God rather than letting God lead us. Friends, Jesus reveals to us what we need to know, and He revealed to the disciples what they needed to know. And sometimes there are clues to things that only later we can understand. And that's exactly what happens when he, when he shares these things with people. But in, in the back of his mind, even though nobody else was going to get it, he knows that God is his help and he's not disgraced. I have set my face like flint knowing that I shall not be put to shame. And indeed, even though in the world's eyes he was put to shame, he certainly was glorified. Remember that voice, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. What did Jesus say last week in the readings? This is, you know, this is the glory, right? I will lift it up. I will draw men to myself. The responsorial psalm comes from Psalm 22, uh, verses 8 and 9, and then 17 and 18, 19, 20, 23, 24. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And of course, now we see that on the cross. Jesus is praying the Psalms on the cross. Okay. And this is where they come from. All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the, on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. If he loves him, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to aid me. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
This is the prayer of Jesus on the cross, friends. You know, when he enters into this, to this, this suffering and this death, what is on his heart, you know? And don't, don't hear, you know, things that Jesus said that he really didn't say. My God, my God, why haven't why have you abandoned me? Is not like this defiant cry from Jesus. It is the fulfillment of the sacrifice he was making. Because what is the wages of sin? Death, spiritual death. And in, in Jesus' sacrifice, he doesn't just have physical pain. He has spiritual separation from God, which as the second member of the, of the Godhead, I mean, we can't even comprehend what that must have been like to be so completely shattered by that experience. And yet he does so out of love for all of us. Our second reading in Mass comes to us from Philippians 2, verse 6 through 11. Christ Jesus, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I like to talk about this when we're meditating on the third joyful mystery, the nativity, and the fruit of that mystery is being detachment. You know, Jesus detaching himself from heaven. He says he was, the, he was in the form of God, that he emptied himself and becomes a human being, but not just a human being like anybody else, but one who was in the form of a slave and being obedient to even death on the cross. That's true detachment, my friends. You know, the, the form of God, but comes down to earth to be executed in the most barbaric way. He detaches himself so that he can come to earth, my friends. And what happens? The result of this is God glorifies him. And he is our king. He's been glorified such that everywhere in the universe, heaven, earth, under the earth, the idea being this, that there will come a time, my friends, in the future when there won't be any atheists, okay? There will not be people who say, well, I still don't really believe in Jesus. No, when Jesus Christ is fully revealed to this world or when people die and they stand before him and are judged, they're going to know, everybody, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. There's not going to be this division. There's not going to be people who, who proclaim other false gods. There's not going to be people who, who have false religions that they persist to. When you die and you come face to face with Jesus Christ, there will be no more doubt, my friends. And you will bend the knee to Jesus Christ. The question is, will you do so on this side of judgment or on that side of judgment, friends? It's a warning to all of us. Because there comes a point in time when on the other side of judgment, friends, if we have entered into hell, even though we may in hell realize our mistake, realize that Jesus Christ is Lord at that moment in time, friends, it's going to be too late. So in light of all of that, let, let's understand, my friends, what our worship should look like, okay? What the worship of all humanity should look like. We saw earlier in our in our in the text of the processional that talked about Palm Sunday, you know, this, this worship that ultimately turned out, you know, for many people to be false worship. Well, now we're going to look at an incredible example of what I call extravagant worship. And I want to really hone in on this idea. The verse before the gospel, Christ became obedient to the point of death. Okay, it's, it's a, a repeat of the Philippians verse. Even death on a cross, because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Make no mistake about it. I just got to say one more thing. You know, we get we get accused as Catholics. Oh, well, you worship Mary, you worship the saints, you worship the Pope. No, 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 friends. We worship Jesus Christ. We worship God alone. okay. Our veneration and devotion to the saints is a reflection of how they show us the power of the name of Jesus Christ. It's not, we won't worship them. We worship Jesus alone. We affirm that there's one name given under heaven by which men must be saved, according to the book of Acts. And that is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. And if you're hearing this, you're thinking, I didn't think Catholics believed that. Read the catechism, my friends. It's there. The Catholic Church brought you that truth, okay, my friends? So keep that in mind. Okay, let's look at our gospel. It comes from Mark chapter 14. The Passover feast 
of unleavened bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him, Jesus, by treachery and put him to death. But they said, not during the festival, for fear that there may be a riot among the people. When he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indigent. Why has there been this waste of this perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days wages and the money given to the poor, and they were infuriated with her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good for, to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests to hand him over to them. When they heard him, they were pleased and promised to pay him money. Then he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when, the, they, were, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat this Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city and, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they reclined at the table and were eating, Jesus said, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and said to him one by one, surely is it not I? He said to them, one of the 12, the one who dips with me into the dish for the son of man indeed goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is, the blood, this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will have your faith shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, <clears throat> even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Then Jesus said to him, amen, I say to you, this night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he vehemently replied, even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all spoke similarly. Then they came to the place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch. He advanced a little further and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but you will. When he returned, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. Then he returned once more and found them asleep. For they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. He returned a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. 
Then while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. At this, they laid hands on him and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them in reply, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I was with you in the temple, teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now a young man followed him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth and about his body. They seized him, but he left the cloth and ran off naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter followed him at a distance into the high priest's courtyard and was seated with the guards, warming himself at the fire. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. So even, even so, their testimony did not agree. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further, what further need have we of, his, of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as deserving to die. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, Prophesy! And the guards greeted him with blows. While Peter was in the courtyard, one of the high priest's maids came along, seeing Peter warming himself. She looked intently at him and said, You too were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out into the outer court. Then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and, be and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Once again, he denied it. A little later, the bystanders said to Peter once more, Surely you are one of them, for you too are a Galilean. He began to curse and swear, I do not know this man whom you are about whom you are talking. And immediately a cock crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priest accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him, Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of? Jesus gave him no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, he used to release them, one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. 
The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the praetorium, and they assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple and weaving a crown of thorns placed it on him. They began to salute him with, Hail, King of the Jews, and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt down before him in homage, and when they stripped him, they had mocked him. They stripped him of his purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon of Cyrenian, who was coming up from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated the place of the skull. They gave him wine drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two revolutionaries, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked him among themselves and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last and said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, mother, the Mary, mother, the the Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joseph and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up from Jerusalem. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having brought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. So that's pretty long text, my friends. And you might be thinking, wow, man, you know, why do we need to read all of this? You know, what, what is the big deal? You know, this is most of Mark's gospel. Most of Mark's gospel is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life because these are the events that, you know, he was so intent on capturing. And of course, and as we read those things, there were many things that we saw earlier in these Psalms about, about the beating of the Lord and, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So many things, friends, but I want to key in on one particular thing that has to do with worship. And it's really the first thing that we read in this gospel reading about what happens when Jesus is in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and this woman that, you know, is not identified in Mark's gospel. And, uh, but John tells us, and it's not identified in Matthew's gospel either, but John tells us this is Mary, um, the, the brother or the sister of, um, of Martha and of Lazarus. She comes and she takes this expensive jar of ointment, dumps it on his head. Now we read, it says that it's worth more than 300 denarii, which basically a denarii was like a day's wages. So 
Think of a day's wages and then multiply that. It's about a year's worth of wages. And she comes and she dumps this out on Jesus. And I want to contrast this act of worship with the worship we saw from the people in the beginning of our text when Jesus comes in on, you know, with the palms, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then all these people later, you know, they abandon him, basically. They cry out for his death. You know, fake worship versus what I'm going to call extravagant worship. And I want to talk about what that looks like. Because I think that, you know, a lot of us struggle with, with the way the world judges our faith and the way the world judges us as believers in Christ. And, you know, sometimes when we worship Jesus, we get mocked for that. We get ridiculed for that. And I, I want to kind of talk about this idea of what it means to worship God without worrying about what other people think. Because this, this woman, Mary, she's the first one really who's like, I'm going to worship Jesus and dump out everything on him and not care what anybody else has. I'm, an, I'm inspired by her and I'm inspired by her worship. And on this you know, Palm Sunday, I want you to be inspired by her as well. So I want to share with you just a couple things, four things actually, about her worship that has just struck me as I read through this. And, and I want to call this, again, extravagant worship. And the first one is this, extravagant worship holds nothing back. Now, you could have said, well, why didn't she just give some, right? She had this entire jar. It was very nice, you know. I mean, wouldn't it have been nice to just anoint Jesus' head? You know, anointing was something that they did as a blessing. Why did she need to take the whole jar and dump on his head? Why not? Because, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, isn't it, right? I mean, he's sitting there. And, I mean, I, I don't know physically how much was in there, but, I mean, probably a lot. It got all over him. Why didn't she just take a little bit? But, you see, here's the thing. When she encounters Jesus, her mindset was not, well, you know, what's appropriate in this social setting or what's going to be, you know, just a little bit. I don't want to go overboard. No, 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 friends. She holds nothing back. Extravagant worship holds nothing back. She doesn't wait, you know, and go, well, we'll space this out, you know, a little here, a little there. No, no. She just says, look, this is my time. And think about what Jesus said about this. He said, look, you, you're going to have the poor. Because, of course, some people were upset about that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But you won't always have me. Now, what does he mean by that? What do you mean? First of all, was he being disrespectful toward the poor? People? No, because he didn't say, don't help them. He said, you can always help them and you should. But what he said to them was this, you won't always have me. Now, what did he mean by that? I think what he means by that is there are some moments in our lives when we come face to face with Jesus, where it's like this pivotal, pivotal moment in our lives where we're being called to, to, to pour out our worship. And, and we have to recognize that those moments aren't everyday moments, my friends. But there are some times when Jesus is real to us in a special way, when he's called us out and we're in the presence of God and we know that he's there and it's time to, to worship him in an extravagant way. He said, look, this is a special time in history. And, and, and she has recognized that. Extravagant worship holds nothing back. Number two, extravagant worship invites the criticism of other people. Think about it. What happened? There were people that were that were upset with what she had done. Even Jesus' disciples were upset about this. They're like, what are you talking about? Especially Judas, because we know that he had ulterior motives, right? But people were like, what? this is a waste. What are you doing? Understand this, my friends. When you give worship to Jesus extravagantly, people are going to criticize you. People are going to think you've gone crazy. You know, you may be, and that for you, you know, it, I think it looks differently to different people, but let's say, you know, you, you have something and you want to pour it out upon God and the work of God and you give extravagantly, you know, I mean, I've seen this happen with people, you know, who, who a relative dies and, you know, the family shows up waiting for their big inheritance only to discover that a huge chunk of it has been given to the work of the Lord. And they're just like, what? That's ridiculous. What a waste. Why did they give so much to the work of the Lord? You see, when, when we, go overboard in our worship, so to speak, what we do, we do a, a few things to other people. The first thing we do is we expose their lack of willingness to do that. So if you, if you, you know, and I'm not talking about doing this for the, for the purpose to be seen by other people, but if you pour yourself out for God, maybe it's in prayer, fasting, going to church a lot, 
you know, doing things to support missions or whatever it might be, there are going to be other people that aren't where you are in your journey that are going to look at you and be like, oh, brother, look at that. That's a waste. You're going overboard. You're going a little too crazy. You need to calm down. That's a hard thing to hear, isn't it? You know, I, I got a comment on a video last week and this, this person said to me, you know, basically this, I'm so sick and tired of all you converts to the Catholic church starting YouTube channels. You know, we're all glad that you're happy to finally be in the right church, but give it a rest. It's a little superficial, you know, just, you know, whatever. And that just really stung me, you know, because I wanted to say, well, what are, what are you doing to spread the faith to people? You know, what are you doing? And, and I, you know, I did respond and it was a little snarky, but that just, you know, when, when you, and I'm not trying to, to compare myself to this woman, but I'm just saying like this, when, when you're in a situation when you're doing stuff to try to worship Jesus or to try to show your gratitude for the Lord, and it's something that other people aren't doing, oftentimes it exposes within them their lack of, of really love for God. And the other thing that happens is people will try to control you. You know, these disciples, these other people in the room, when she gave this extravagant gift to Jesus, they said, whoa, whoa hold on a minute. We shouldn't be doing that. We should take it and give it to the poor. You know, they, 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 we should do it this way. You know, don't let somebody control your worship, my friends. Now, I'm not saying that you can just go do whatever you want willy nilly and whatever. But what I'm saying is like in your personal devotion to the Lord, if you're if you're worshiping Jesus and other people are coming to you and trying to like manage you and control you and tell you, oh, you shouldn't be that devoted. You shouldn't pray that many prayers. You shouldn't give that much. You shouldn't go to confession that often. You shouldn't do all. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Just don't listen to them, friends. You see, because the world doesn't like out of control worship of Jesus. They don't like unbridled, un, unrestrained love of God. Because the world wants to control everybody. Even religious people want to control other people how they're doing that. You see, it convicts people when they see other people worshiping extravagantly. I know I feel that way. You know, when I see somebody doing, doing things at a different level than what I'm doing, man, I tell you what, it convicts me. It makes me want to step up my game. It makes me think, man, I'm not doing enough. I'm not, you know, I'm, my, my worship of the Lord is nothing compared to what this guy's doing. You know, and it's not that, that people are doing things to be seen by others, but, you know, we can see when someone is completely pouring themselves out. I remember thinking that when I started going to adoration, you know, here I was like a new Catholic going to adoration. And I'd never done anything like that before in my, in my former life. And here I was like, oh, I'm so super spiritual. I was going to the church at two o'clock in the morning to pray for an hour. Wow. Look at me. Right. And I was kind of feeling a little bit like proud of myself, you know? And then I see this little, this little old lady in the church. She's since gone to meet Jesus and she's in the church. And I was told by others that, you know, sometimes she spends the entire night there. Like she would literally go to church and spend the night in adoration all night long. And then after the morning mass where they put Jesus back in the tabernacle, then she would go home. And I thought to myself, man, oh, you know, I, I can never get full of myself for anything I'm ever doing because there's, you know, people out there doing way more. I mean, that's happened to me many, many times, my friends. Because extravagant worship, you know, it, it convicts other people. Now, who knows? Maybe she had people in her life that were looking at her going, oh, mom or grandma or whatever, or aunt, whatever. You know, do you really need to do that? Isn't that a little too much? But you know what? She was going to be undeterred in her faith. So recognize this. If you're going to be an extravagant worshiper of Jesus, other people are going to criticize you. And you got to be okay with that. You got to let that go because number three is this extravagant worship shows incredible love toward Jesus, especially and only though, really, if it's done out of love. Now, if you're extravagantly worshiping so other people can see you, then forget it. I don't think this woman was doing that because Jesus knows people's hearts. Right. And he wouldn't have said about her wherever the gospel is preached. You know, this will be this will be told of her if she was a fake and a hypocrite and just doing it to be pleased by others. He could see the love in her heart. He knew why she was doing this. He said, this is a beautiful thing she has done unto me. He, he could look right through her. He knew why she was doing that. And it was because of love. And when we pour out our worship to Jesus extravagantly and completely, friends, it's, it, it's the best way that we can show him love, friends. Because number four, and this is the, this is the most important thing, my friends. Our pouring out of ourselves, our extravagant worship to Jesus unites our sacrifice 
with his ultimate sacrifice. See, what did he say about her? He said, she has done this to prepare me for my burial. Right, And just after this, we read where Jesus t- he offers the Eucharist to his disciples. And he talks about, this is my blood, which would be poured out for you. You see, she pours out this perfume. He pours out his blood. She gives all of what she has, pouring it out on him. And what does he do, my friends? He gives all of what he has, pouring it out upon us. This Beautiful act of worship where she pours it out on him is a prefiguration of what Jesus is going to do on the cross, friends. And there wasn't any holding back from Jesus. He didn't say, I'll just spill a little of my blood for you. I mean, don't we need to space this out? That would be a little ridiculous, you know, to go overboard. No, friends, he gives himself freely. And I think he sees in her that she's doing the same thing. She's pouring out that most valuable thing that she has, all of it onto him, uniting her sacrifice with his. Friends, what does that look like for you and I? What does it look like for you and I to worship the Lord extravagantly? What can you pour out on Jesus? What do you have that when the when you give it to the Lord, the world looks at you and says, you're crazy. Why are you doing that? That's overboard. That's a pretty good indication, friends, that you're on the right track. But be ready for the criticism of others. It will happen. They will try to hold you back. They will try to control you. They will try to question your motives. My friends, do it anyway. Worship him extravagantly. Now, I can't tell you what that looks like for you. I'm still trying to figure out what it looks like for me. But I think that this is the key. When we're given that opportunity, when we're faced with Jesus and we know that this is what it's all about, friends, may we be inspired by by this beautiful act, by Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. May we recognize the love that she had for Jesus and may that love inspire us as well. Friends, I know this has been a long video, a long study. Because we had a lot of text to read, but this is a big moment, friends. This is this is you need to be ready for Palm Sunday when you when you walk into Mass and you hear these words. I want this ringing in your ears. I want your heart to be presented to the Lord there, even in Mass, as pouring out yourself in worship. Sometimes that's a, a great way to do it: is to go to Mass and just be so attentive to the readings and so attentive to what Jesus is doing right there on the altar. Recognize that you are being pulled into the story, friends. Our faith is not a story about what's happened. Our faith, we're we're invited into this story. We are not outsiders looking at this stuff going, oh, wow, that was neat. Friends, we are right smack dab in the middle of it. Right there. So friends, I want you to keep that in mind as you attend Mass this week, I pray you have an incredible Holy Week. I pray that as, as you're beginning that, that your Lenten practice is drawing you even more closely into this relationship with Jesus. So friends, may you be filled with the Holy Spirit and may you worship extravagantly. Thanks so much for watching Unpacking the Mass. I hope this has been helpful to you and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Drop me a comment. Let me know um, what this looks like for you and how this is helping you, or maybe you think it's crazy. That's okay too. But I'm just so excited and honored to have this opportunity to help prepare you for mass. Remember my remarks do not replace your priest homily. They're only to help prime the pump to get you thinking so that when you walk in, you hear this, you, 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 you're already in that place. And I pray that that's what it does for you, friends. Thank you so much. And God bless all of you. Take care.